This is a trading world of men, women, and children who cannot live on gravity alone, need something to satisfy their gayer, light moods and hours. And he who ministers to this want is in a business established by the author of our nature. If he worthily fulfills his mission and amuses without corrupting, he need never feel that he has lived in vain. P.T. Barnum If you look back on it, there was nothing in my parents' life before they started a family that would have led you to believe that they would raise a kid like me. It's very simple what I'm going to do. I'm just going to take this light bulb. I'm going to bite into it. I'm going to chow down on the broken glass. Now, don't take my word for it that this glass is real. Their, their mantra was always, you know, do whatever you have to do to be happy. Um, and for me, it's eating glass and having nails in my nose. But, you know, hey. Let me unscrew it here. Oh, it's warm, which is great because there's nothing like a hot meal. You see, Gina, I'm going to bite into this thing, but some people might not think this is real. The glass eating? Yeah, eating the glass eating I actually did earlier. I, I've been doing that uh, for about 15 years or so, maybe even more. Now, do me a favor. I don't know if everyone got a chance to take a look at this, so please, everyone that did take a look at the light bulb, tell everyone else, is the light bulb real? Yes. Is it made out of glass? Yes. Thank you. I'm glad you said that. Because some people might find this a little hard to swallow. Mm. Mm. Oh, look, look, stuffing. I love stuffing. It's broken glass stuffing, but stuffing nevertheless. Mm. <coughs> It'll be over soon. Mm. You say in the show uh, you have a daily um, diet and regimen. Diet. What is that? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, let me just say that it, I eat a lot of fiber to keep everything happy. And uh, there's some herbal things that I do that keep everything very kind of uh, lubricated and, and uh, um, flowing freely. You know, there's one thing that makes us all worthwhile. That's the look on your faces right now, <laughs> especially yours, yeah. <laughs> Makes this whole ordeal we're doing. And then I got talking to a friend of mine who uh, reminded me of, uh, about the glass. And I went, yeah, yeah, I learned about that. Uh, this is dangerous. I know this. But I'll try it. Then people often ask, what's the proper beverage to serve with broken glass? Beer, wine? No, 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 no. This is not really Wendex, no. It's just water with some um, blue food coloring in it for the joke and some alcohol to disinfect the bulb. <laughs> because of what I know, believe it or not, I have eaten over 3,000 light bulbs. <sighs> now. Yeah. All done. Oh, you like that? Worked it up and was rewarded with knowing that that I learned the right way of doing it because uh, now, all these years later, I'm still standing and haven't, haven't kicked yet. I got started when I was about 12 years old, 13 years old, learning this stuff. Some of the old guys used to hang around that magic shop, had worked sideshows. It just turned out that when I, my youthful enthusiasm, said, I want to learn how to do sideshow stuff. Uh, they were there going, OK, I'll teach you. And he showed me. And I really didn't do it that much. I didn't perform it when I was a kid. That can be. But I did have the skill. I didn't learn the proper way of doing it. So that years later, when I resurrected that, I could show them that I was serious and I had learned the proper way. And then that gave me entree to learn other stuff. You know, the m m was created in World War II. It's true. And it was specifically designed for GIs so they wouldn't get their 
fingers all messy when they ate candy. My name is Todd Robbins, and I'll be your master of ceremonies for the show here. Watch the professor. Actually, I need them all burning, so let me go like this, like this, like this. What you just saw me do? Hurt like hell. I've met a lot of great people. Uh, you know, there's there some shifty folks in the, the carnival and the sideshow, but there's some great people. Oh, it's all interesting. It's all um, immoral. It should be illegal. When I first started into that kind of extreme, it was four nine-inch spikes. And I get on four spikes and put my arms and legs in the air so that I'm completely on those nails. I would have to say, yes, I'm a woman with a beard. I would, I'm not the bearded lady, which is the title for, for a sideshow role. And the next thing you know, you have this house full, full of two-headed babies and unicorns, and it needs a place to live. I mean, I think I draw a little bit from sideshow and a little bit from rock and roll. This 10-inch barbell that is held by both of my nipples, and I can crush objects by the sheer force of my nipples. Now don't try this at home because this has caused permanent damage to my left eye and I have unfortunately ripped out both of my eyelids doing this. This act is called eye hooks. Sideshows would always have uh, what they call the, the pretty act. Um, something that wasn't disgusting or disturbing to kind of give you a break from, from the freak you just saw. The Wild West performer would serve this purpose also in the sideshows. I like people who look at life differently. I like I find people who live within life's boundaries uninteresting. I find people who live outside the boundaries marvelously fascinating people. In the old days, there were people in every town, every city in the United States were exposed to a sideshow once a year. And the way that people used to join a sideshow is the way he did. People would come and see the show, and they would join the show. The one great thing about this, about circuses or sideshows or vaudeville or anything cool is it's a direct connection to your childhood. Okay, uh, this is Coney Island. We're at the kind of the center of it all. This is Stillwell and Surf Avenue. Um, Steeplechase Park was right down there. Dreamland was right down there. Luna Park was right over there. Let's start off by, you know, where you grew up and your family. I really don't want to talk about it. It's okay with you. Uh, I grew up in Southern California. My father was, was born in California. And my mother actually was born in Minnesota. Both of my parents grew up in the Depression, and it's a fairly common thing that you get people that, that came through that. It was not an easy time, and you just didn't know what the future was going to hold. So they worked very hard to make a better life than they had. Uh, and that's part of that attitude was to kind of give my, my brother and I a free reign to do whatever we wanted to do. Because what you see before you is a sideshow geek wasn't always the case. I grew up in a uh, clean, safe, quiet, suburban community in Southern California. It bored the daylights out of me. It was the kind of place that persistently insisted that this was not a way of life, this was the way of life. There was no need to ask questions. Everything you could possibly want, it was right here, including the fact that the liquor stores opened at 6 a.m. I wanted something more, and I didn't know what it was. As I was growing up, I was exposed to a lot of different things and kind of went in different directions and with uh, a great deal of support uh, from my parents. And one of them was magic. A magic shop had opened in our neighborhood, and uh, I'd been bitten by the magic bug. And I'd learned some magic tricks, because that was something kind of unusual. But I wanted something more. I wanted to see real magic. 
There was a group of young magicians in Southern California in my hometown of Long Beach, California, that um, called the Long Beach Mystics. And then I got involved with the Magic Castle up in Hollywood as a junior member of the Magic Castle. And um, at the same time was doing theater in school and stuff like that. And I just basically wanted to pursue performing. After the end of high school, I, I went to college, got a degree in Bachelor of Arts in, th in Theater, which is a great useless degree. It's almost as bad as a degree in film. So I studied classical theater and voice and you know, all the movement and all the, the stuff that goes with it, and did some theater, a lot of theater in San Francisco. And then moved to New York here about 21 years ago, and got a sublet around the corner from here for six months, with some people who were going on tour, and uh, lived in their apartment, looked around and found an apartment that we're in right now. And I've lived here for over 20 years. It's just been a great little cheap place that that is pretty low maintenance, uh, that I can just lock the door and go off and go to Branson and go uh, you know, travel around and do whatever I want, not have to really worry about things too much. And in the meantime, I was just taking whatever would, would come along and I got an, a call one time for a TV show where they wanted something unusual. And I was like, well, what could I do? And I went, you know, there's the old stunt that I learned when I was a kid. I was sticking your hand into an animal trap. I'm just going to take a part of my body and I'm going to stick it into that trap just like that character. Not that part of the body, okay? So I put it in the magic app, the comedy magic. So I would do a magic trick and I'd say, that's a trick, but this isn't. And I'd bring out the animal trap and set it up and do it. And people would come up later and they go, no, that had to be a trick. You can't really do that. And I go, no, this is, this is just this is a real thing. And that's why they call me the pain-proof man. This is something that's been done on the sideshow for years. And you, you do it. It's, it's legitimate. It's, there's no deception. So I learned it all. And it's taken me across the country and around the world. Now to places like Coney Island. By the sea, by the beautiful sea, you and me, you and me, oh, how happy we'll be. When each wave comes a-rolling in, we will sing or swim, and we'll float and feel around the water, over and under, and then up for air. Eyes rich, eyes rich, so now what do we care? I love to be beside your side, beside the sea, beside the sea, beside the beautiful sea. Hot dogs, ice cream, soda pop, bathing suits, umbrellas, sunglasses, fish and poles. Hurry, 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 ladies and gentlemen, step right up and see one of the greatest attractions of the boat park. And all it costs you is one thin dime, ten cents, one tenth of a dollar. I love to be beside your side, beside the sea, beside the seaside, by the beautiful sea. We had two German tourists who had come in and spent 50 cents each on coffee. And they didn't know that Todd was there for an audition, and they couldn't believe that for 50 cents, like, they didn't understand the exchange rate. They got this incredible floor show where a guy was hammering nails into his head and eating light bulbs just for two people for a cup of coffee. Um, wherever he had come from, he had all the skills. He knew the sideshow traditions, and he was hired like that and uh, was in our show starting in 1992 as a full-time performer that season. First of all, understand that a sideshow to begin with is a New York City art form. Invented by P.T. Barnum, downtown Manhattan, Broadway and Ann Street in 1842. But after Barnum, the history of sideshows basically moves from downtown Manhattan right here to Coney Island. From the 1880s on, Coney Island is the sideshow capital of the world. Now, the mother of all sideshows was the Dreamland Circus Sideshow put together by Samuel Gumperts. 
And that wasn't a 10 in one, that was probably a 20 in one. It was incredible. But in Coney Island, in its heyday, you didn't have one, you didn't have two sideshows, you had five of them competing with each other in neighborhood all at the same time. We're proud that the building we're currently in here at the corner of Surf and West 12th Street in the 1950s and early 60s was David Rosen's Wonderland Circus Sideshow. So there is history in the very building we're in and continuity, and that's pretty awesome. We are the last place anywhere that you can see an authentic 10 act in one circus sideshow, and it's appropriate that we're doing it in Coney Island, which was always home base for sideshow culture. Um, doing it in New York City in Coney Island, we think we've picked the right location for the National Center of Americano Bizarro. That's easy. I grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut, a blue collar industrial city in New England, but it's P.T. Barnum's adopted hometown. Barnum was mayor of Bridgeport. There were statues of Barnum all over Bridgeport. There's streets named after him. When you grow up in Bridgeport, Connecticut, you end up thinking that midgets, that freak shows, that elephants are all American. So my obsessions as a child were Barnum, were sideshows, were amusement parks, were vaudeville. So that when I end up with two degrees in theater, and what do you do with two degrees in theater? You obviously move to New York City. I had this wacky idea that instead of aspiring to Broadway or being at Joe Papp's public theater, Coney Island could be a staging ground for large spectacle. That's the place for me. I was walking down the boardwalk, peering at the Coney Island sideshow, and Dick Ziggin came out and said, <clears throat> well, we're, we were looking for a, a bearded lady for our sideshow. And I am a woman with a beard. Ouch, not a metaphor. Now you notice I'm As soon as I hear a sideshow, I think of two things immediately. I think Siamese twins, and I think of the bearded lady. Right, right. Why do you think that people are so fascinated by that? Well, it crosses gender boundaries, so that's fascinating. That's just endlessly fascinating to people. Why is that fascinating to people? I don't know. It's probably fascinating to people because we all are in constant, if not battle, dialogue or interesting, loving interaction with the many sides of ourselves that might not always fit in our prescribed gender. Why did I let the beard grow? Well, um... You know, I'm always wondering that myself. Why did I let the beard grow? Um, at the time, it seemed um, that I was um, encountering shame when I was in getting rid of the beard. I was feeling shame. I felt like I had something problematic and that I had to hide it, and I didn't. And I, and I knew that this really had something to do with a prescribed. Um, heterosexist view of what a woman should look like. So I, you know, was a young, a young, young feminist who mm -hmm. thought, hey man, I don't want to be living in this shameful state. If I was going to use the beard in language to describe myself, I would have to say, yes, I'm a woman with a beard. I'm not the bearded lady, which is the, which is, which we hear basically as the uh, title for, for a right. sideshow role. The image of the sideshow, uh, throughout history, it's been looked at as something negative or exploitive. I wanted to ask you what your opinion was of the history of the sideshow. Nasty, nasty, nasty. Nasty business, the sideshow. Boo. The whole concept, you know, of, of exhibiting people for profit, it's nasty lineage. But it's a theater form, you know, and it's developed, there's been some great performers. And um, there's, there's a lot about the form that's great about it, you know. There's a lot about the, it was theater outside the theater arena. Everybody came to see it. People still, everybody comes to see it down at Coney Island. You know, it's these short, tight acts and the f form of the ballet I love. And also from my circus 
world history, and just aesthetically, I was, you know, actually quite turned on to the to the look, to the banners, to the history, to its link with circus. You know, I've learned so much from so, from from some of the great performers. Have you ever talked to some of the other w uh, women who had been? The bearded lady in uh, past no, sideshows from older sideshows. I have met I have met Priscilla, the monkey girl. Yes, but I but we haven't we didn't really get to talk too much. How much of this is taken out when you go out into the street into your personal life, around ah, the street? As and, Jennifer, as How Jennifer, be in yes, the street? yes, ah. yes. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. And it's good. I mean, it has its moments in right. the summer. With the, uh, you know, I don't, you know, in the winter there's a lot of bundling, there's a lot of passing, you know, they don't know. Second glance, I'm not trying to pass, right. and we mean pass as male by that. But I think that there's, you know, there's enough long hair boys that I don't get a lot of second glances. In the summer it can be hard. Yeah. In the summer it can be, it can be hard. You know, you don't want to wear the little t-shirt and. You and you find is it more of a, a positive or negative reaction? Quizzical. 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 Do you mind it though? Sometimes I get irritated. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I've some. I see. You know, I just feel it less, or I, I encounter it less these days. I don't know why. Certainly, a lot of performing, which I got in my days at the sideshow, got me very comfortable being in front of people talking about my beard. Yeah. Right. 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 I mean, it also. I mean, oh, it was, was also like a ka-ching, You know, numbers pay off. When you work at the Coney Island and you're doing whatever 12 shows a day many days a week for many years you actually meet a lot of fucking new yorkers you know what i mean so your percentages of people who go hey aren't you the yada yeah you know go way up from before i started working there could be hey what's that right you know? now, now like, you're hey. almost like a, you're the local celebrity sure you know? yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. please don't call me a freak i'm not worthy of the title see i'm technically i'm a working act I know when I say freak, you have a certain image of what that's all about, but I gotta tell you, that image probably is not accurate. You see, you have this image that the freak was some misshapen person that was trotted out on stage to be gawked at by people. The elephant man, for instance. Well, the fact is, that did exist in the sideshow, but that was the exception, not the rule. What you don't realize is that the freaks are the royalty of the sideshow. They are paid more than anyone else. The freaks often own the show. So if they were being exploited, it was themselves that was doing the exploiting. And I gotta tell you, it's not what you think. Like a man with no legs would come walking out on his hands. And for a moment you look at this and you think monster. And then he jumps up on the chair and starts to tell you about his life story, about how he came to be that way and how he's adapted. And all of a sudden you realize there's a human being there. And all of a sudden it twists your mind around exactly what your definition of what a human being is. And then they'll go on to demonstrate some strange and unusual ability that has taken them beyond the, the uh, limitations of their misshapen body. Basically, all the great freak acts were a demonstration of the human spirit ability to overcome, well, almost any obstacle. And it was a very empowering experience seeing these. And so don't call me a freak, because I'm not worthy. You see, there are three kinds of acts in the sideshow. The freaks, people who were born different. Then there's the self-made freak, people that were born like you and me, and had done something to uh, adapt themselves and make themselves special, like the uh, tattoo men and women are a good example of that. And then there's what's known as the working act. And basically what they demonstrate is something very special, strange, unusual abilities, some of the things that I've learned, and I am a working act. What I'm gonna do is first pour out the glass into a perilous pile. Next, the footwear is removed. Not only will you see me walk over broken bottles in my bare feet, not only will you hear the glass crunching underneath my feet, but this is also one stunt, you can smell, yeah. Now the feet are examined to make sure they're free of any kind of preparation. Hi, Gina. 
Let me just come down here. And there we go. Just, just, just take a look at this one. Look at that. Okay, and what about this one? There's nothing on that one, is there? Thank you very much. Gina, have you ever been to, uh, hold on to that for a second. Have you ever been to Bayonne, New Jersey in August? No? Well, now you know what it smells like. Okay. If you give me a moment to focus and concentrate, I will show you what many people consider to be an amazing demonstration of belief. I have got to get a real job. All right. Uh, Gina, in a nice loud voice, would you say a number between one and five? Four. Four, very good, thank you. One, two, three, four. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. No blood. But I will take that applause anyway. Thank you. There are many names for the sideshow. Uh, it's called the sideshow because usually when you walked on Midway, if you're going to a circus, it was on the side there. Um, it's also called a back-end show. It's also called a back-end show, and that, that's a carnival term. The idea of the carnival actually started at the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, because that was the first big midway that had brought in independent operators to run the various pavilions and things. Because when you walk onto a carnival lot, uh, it is set out in this big kind of horseshoe or oval, and you walk in, up front are games and uh, food joints. Uh, places where you get caught, cotton candy, popcorn, things like that. Beyond that are the rides usually in the center. And along the sides and towards the back of this loop, that's where you'd find the sideshows. Yeah, but so sideshows were, were in various places. They were in play, amusement parks like Coney Island. They were on carnivals and, uh, and circuses. So they've been part of uh, Coney Island, like I say, in, since the late part of the 19th century. And... Originally, they were kind of independent things. There were small units. They were like singlos. A singlo is a single attraction, uh, whereas a ten and one is also known as a string show because there was numerous attractions strung together. And what that meant was that in this one show, you're going to see ten different acts: the fire eater, the sword swallower, the bearded lady, the, the snake charmer, uh, the contortionist, the the, the midget, um, you know, the knife thrower, and on and on until you had ten acts. The earliest circus sideshow we have record of, uh, which was actually a wax museum, uh, which was back, goes back to the 1850s. And before that, the kind of embryonic um, start of the sideshow was in the Dime Museums. The American place. Dime Museum is the world's only archive, museum, and exhibition space devoted to novelty and variety exhibition. Uh, to most people in the outside world, I suppose they'd call that sideshow. Uh, but of course it's a lot bigger than that. It traces the history of sideshows back into their origins and the dime museums it cost 10 cents to get in back in the early days of the 19th century uh, when those uh, dime museums were filled with collections of the weird, the strange, the bizarre, the exotic, and the unusual, uh, as well as live entertainment um, in addition to all the static attractions. Uh, they were the first multimedia entertainment spaces of their age and of course they not only became sideshows but they also gave birth to vaudeville and burlesque and uh, one could say gave a leg up to the movie industry in the early days. But what was it that got you and James uh, to decide that you wanted to actually open up the American Time Museum? Well, we had similar collections. Uh, James, of course, was always interested in the history of, of the American sideshow and performers, and my interest lay more in uh, the museum aspect of it and roadside attractions. And of course, I was making things for museums and roadside attractions, and a was couple it of which. Exclusively for like vaudeville and carnival stuff. Uh, it was no. It was uh, a little bit of everything related to fanciful creatures or uh, odd situations. Uh, there oddities. oddities, yeah, anomalies, things that should have existed but didn't. I once made a machine that recorded odors. It didn't really record odors, but I felt that there should be a machine that recorded odors. So. Well, it depends on the odor. Uh, what's the history of this building itself? Uh, when 
you guys got started here. The space that we're in at the moment here at 1808 Maryland Avenue, uh, these buildings go back, I suppose, to the late 1800s, somewhere around 1870. And we set our own museum up here about uh, four years ago, I suppose it's been now. Uh, November 1st, 1999 being the seminal date. I started collecting around the time I started work on Shocked and Amazed, uh, my sideshow journal, because you interview those people, and the next thing you know, they're giving you things. <laughs> the idea behind the American Dime Museum originated with my partner, Dick Horn, and, uh, and me deciding that uh, we'd reach critical mass for both of us, and we looked at each other one day in the summer of 99 and did one of those, uh, I think we can do this. And we did, and the next thing we knew, within six months, we had this museum. And it's grown from the initial uh, space in the one building that's grown into two buildings, and it's four galleries now. It's a collection of over 800 attractions in these four galleries. So uh, as, as Teller, Penn and Teller put it, uh, it's really dense in there. And it is, but I, I don't think he was talking about the, the proprietors, at least I hope he wasn't. But. This is it. This is the one you read about, you heard about it. Now you got to see it live right here. It's the Sideshow. It's the world's greatest gathering of human curiosities. Everything you see depicted on the beautiful banners from way down there. The correct term is outside talker. Uh, the term barker, I'm not exactly certain where that came from. I have a feeling it was probably something that a journalist applied to an outside talker, but I'm not certain about that. Go right there, get your ticket, get on the inside, now's the time to go. I gotta you know, some say it's never been used, others say, oh, it's an old term, some say it's an accurate term, you know, some say it's, it's not an accurate term, and, and so I don't know. I, but the, the, the term that is used most often is outside talker. Two ton Tessie from Tuscaloosa is the most So the origin for the outside Alabama. talker's Bally would be? Bally who? The 1893 World's Fair in Chicago, the Columbia Exposition, uh, there were a couple of things that came out of that. In a place called the Streets of Cairo, which was an exhibit, was a big pavilion that you would go into, and they had uh, dancers and musicians and performers from Egypt. Um, and the guy who ran this was a guy named W.O. Taylor, a showman, and in order to gather a crowd, he would have some of the performers come out on the midway and do this little impromptu performance. And when they'd come running out, they could go, they'd yell, Dialohun, Dialohun, which is like for the love of Allah, Dialohun. And he didn't, couldn't quite understand what the hell they were saying. So he would go, uh, yeah, give me, uh, come on out and give me one of those, those ballyhoos. Let's do a little ballyhoo here. And the term was picked up by the other showman because there were all these other exhibits in the, the fair. And it became synonymous with those little performances that were done out front to gain attention. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we feel our show is large, and we feel our show is self-explanatory. I'm sort of a student of P.T. Barnum. I'm interested, though, in, in all of it, you know, the circus, the sideshow, Coney Island, Wild West stuff. Um, I just kind of figured that if this kind of thing didn't exist anymore, I would have to recreate it to experience it. Hey, now, look here. Hey, now, look here. This is the one you heard about. This is the one they're all talking about. It's the Brothers Grimm Circus Sideshow ever asked metaphorically to have a reason for what I do, I couldn't deliver a metaphor. I just tell you simply, it's to give people a smile. You do this out of love. You don't do it, you know, and, and the art. I mean, it's, it's fun to create something like this. It's really fun to see the kids get turned on to Circus Sideshow and, and the world because a lot of people don't know anything about this genre at all. Music has taken over the entertainment industry so much that it's really fun to offer an alternative to that, whether it's vaudeville, burlesque, sideshow, I don't care what it is. Something else for people to watch besides music.
you know, in live entertainment. time I do it, it morphs into something a little bit different. Um, it's ridiculously expensive to put this on, and doing it here in Seaside Heights, it has its problems. We're out on a pier. We had a blowdown, our first blowdown last week. The whole tent came crashing down. And uh, so you just, you pick it all up and set it up again, you know? It's, it's when you do it on a canvas like this that you get a real feel for what the old time guys went through. It's more than just the show you see. It's really about climbing on top of ladders and latching down the tent in torrential monsoon rains. It's about uh, pounding stakes in 110 degree weather with wasps flying under your shirt. Those are the things you don't think about. I hate heat, humidity, and high winds, and I get all three of them constantly here, like working on you all at once. I wish I was like in an air-conditioned bubble. But I know come January, I'll be sitting in the winter going, gee, I wish I was out on the pier listening to the ocean every night. And anybody that's ever done a real sideshow, um, it just about kills you. But somehow you find energy in your passion and you keep going. In the meantime, we've also yeah. done some other things, uh, most recent of which is we've started the Sideshow School, in which... Which um, you're the dean of. Yeah, which I teach uh, the classes out there and, and run that. <laughs> Tastes like reptile. All right. So where did that thing you put them? So how long is this one? Underneath the in snakes. The snake pen. Under, under the uh, snakes' armpits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I just put them on top of the heater, so you, you can yeah. feel they're a little bit uh, yeah. a little nicer. Uh, so yeah, let's. Uh, who wants to give us a try? I want to try. Uh, a couple times a year, we do classes out there teaching people how to swallow swords and eat fire, and carry on that tradition too, because that's dying off. In my country, that means you're now married. You know, the most dangerous and difficult of all the sideshow skills is sword swallowing. It's uh, dangerous because basically you're taking two feet of uh, steel and you're shoving it down your throat. And that is the other thing that if you're going to do sword swallowing, um, you know, that you have to consider for your presentation what you're going to do with it, and what, what, why. Because again, if if people ask that when you when they see you doing any of this stuff, they're going, why are they doing it? And if you don't give them an explanation, but come up with their own, it might not be the one you want. So, would you like to see me swallow a sword? Sure. All right, here we go. Ooh, looked pretty good, didn't it? 
The problem I have is once I get it in a little bit, my body, like, I can't stop myself from swallowing. Mm -hmm. And when I'm swallowing while the sword is in there, that's when I start to get the problem, and then the gag reflex will mm -hmm. come on. I also know just enough about the, the sensation that if I'm doing it, well, I, I know what I can force and what I can't force. But that's just from doing it for years and, and just knowing that, okay. And the other thing about it is, if it's if I'm having a little heart, but this is a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. I know that if I'm having a little trouble, it's I just have to relax a little bit more and just put a little more pressure on it. To a certain degree, if I'm, if I'm, I know the difference between having a little difficulty and not going to be able to do it. Yeah. And a couple of times I've hit the spot and it's like, what the hell is that? Well, let's not, let's not screw with it. If I blink in a, in a way, uh, the gag reflex will start to come back. All of a sudden I'll start to tense up a little bit. So I just want to relax and just kind of work through it and go, okay, let's just get it down. Down the hatch without a scratch. You know, after they see me shove two or three things down my throat, it's less an amazing skill and more just evidence of oral fixation. Very simply, folks, this is three times as dangerous as anything else. Because first, that tube is made out of glass. If that should break inside of me, well, I don't have to tell you how dangerous, how perilous that would be. And inside this glass is radioactive neon gas. Okay, it's not radioactive, but it's really nasty stuff. It is, it is so awful. I mean, it's almost as bad as the air in a New York City taxi cab. And then add to that about a gazillion volts of electricity, and you have why this is so damn dangerous. And the thing I like best about this is not that it's so dangerous, not that it's so unusual, but this proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that sword swallowing is real. Because when I swallow this, if you look very carefully, you can actually see it shining through the walls of my throat, in the upper part of my chest. <sighs> and by the way, if you're wondering why I keep licking these things, it's because, like so many things in life, if you want to be successful with it, you got to get it hot and wet. <laughs> Here we go. <sighs> yeah, there's a lot of interest in uh, in learning these skills. Because people have seen little bits and pieces of them and uh, some of the old performers and some people like myself and are just fascinated by it. And we not only just teach them technique, but we also run people through uh, the history and the heritage and where it all came from and why it's done the way it's done and, and the reason these things have the traditions they have. So, uh, okay, let's play with fire for a little bit, shall we? Fire and as to why you're doing what you're doing and, and, and putting that content into what you do. Because the people like that, that's what they hang on to. The, the, there's the gross out and the shock value of all this stuff. And uh, it's really the presentational element of who you are doing it that uh, is the most important thing. 
but I may be wrong. I mean, there are people who are historians who write things down, and then there are people who take the historical performance and not necessarily try to recreate it, but try to keep the same context within a current performance context, you know, it's so that it's a, it's, it's a slowly developing thing. Todd does that. You know, I went other directions. Yeah. Did you ever want to do this? You know, when I was a little kid, I did the normal little kid of, you can't do that. Well, then, you, then that's fighting words. You have to figure out how. Now I'm considerably more mellowed in my middle age. <laughs> and I still do it. <laughs> I still have to figure it out. But I don't accept everything that people say to me that way as a challenge because I just don't have time to do everything. I love to see health professionals in the audience. They're so used to what can't happen that they have no idea of what you really can do. That I've been doing this for <laughs> over 20 years and I still haven't ended up in a hospital is pretty good. I've cracked a couple of ribs, I've ripped an eyelid open, and I've gotten you know, bumps, bruises, and a couple of other broken bones. I, I tend to go through theme years for injuries. <laughs> Give them a round of applause. <laughs> the bed of nails. Yeah. How many nails are in that bed of nails? Well, which one? I mean, right now, as far as I know, I have two world records for beds of nails. This is also one of those things that uh, people associate with the side show, the sword swallow, the fire eater, the fat lady, and the bed of nails. You know, and several thousand years ago, the predecessor for a bed of nails, which was lying on thorns. I've laid on thorns, it's pretty easy. The only thing is when you get up from them, you need somebody to pick them out of your back. And we have this image of the fake tears of India sitting on bed of nails, you know, meditating and all this. Uh, like some mystical thing where it, it's not, it's all just anatomy and physics. For probably 15 years after every performance, I'd put the bed of nails out on the floor and teach anybody from the audience who wanted to how to lie on it. Now, this is something that Harley Newman, who I've mentioned before, uh, after the show, he'll, he'll bring students up and teach them just do what we just did because they look and they go, I can't do that. And go, well, why don't you confront your fears? And he explains exactly what goes into it and has them do it. And all of a sudden, they're all excited because they've done something that they didn't think was possible. So it can be a very powerful thing. A nail board, that's, that's the ultimate gazoony act. I mean, any numbskull can do the nail board, right? So I built the nail board, and I built it wrong, and couldn't stand stretching out on that thing to save my life. Monkeyed with it some more, got it feeling a little bit better. It was still cutting me up. It's like, this is supposed to be easier than this. This is not a complicated thing. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. They get, you know, gazooms off the, off the midway to just do this act when, they, when, when, when the people screw and they leave. You know, how, how am I not doing this right? And there's, there's nothing to it. Finally, get together that night with, uh, with Todd and Harley. And uh, I'm talking with them about, well, gee, I got the, I have the nail board in a car. You know? It's a basic bed of nails, let's say a thousand nails. It's nothing. You can learn it in 30 seconds. Sure enough, I stretch out on the thing, and, and Todd's line to me was, you're going to love this. You see, I did bring a bed of nails. Pressure on any individual point to actually do puncture. Because the pressure per square inch on, on each nail is God, something like seven and a half tons. <laughs> Just because it's this little tiny point of a nail and I weigh a little over 200 pounds, that's a lot of weight on a very small area. Um, since I started doing the four nails, I've worked my way down to two. What I really want for an audience is to be able to take some of the things they've been scared of. And you know, since I'm doing physical things, usually I'm dealing with physical fears. Um, and give them a different twist. So that instead of being scared of something, they leave with a sense of awe and amazement. And that turns into something that empowers them in their everyday life. Because they can walk away and say, you know, I, I saw this guy and he, he did that.
not sure. I think I've figured out how to do one, one nail. come home in New York and the light is flashing on the answering machine, you never know what it's going to be, but you know it's going to be something interesting. I became involved with the Big Apple Circus about 15 years ago. I had just come off the road with the Spike Jones show. It's about 1987 or so, and I would do all the corporate stuff for the Big Apple Circus. That when XYZ Corporation wanted to do some sort of a big event, make it circus themed, I was the guy who got the call to usually ringmaster the show. So this one year they decided they needed someone, not a ringmaster, but they needed a central character that they could hang the show upon. And it was called, uh, the show was called Jazzmatazz. So Big Apple Circus calls and says, this comedian we've hired to do the show cannot perform on Yom Kippur. It's one of our preview performances and we need someone to fill in for one performance. Would you do it? Uh, I went down, I did the one performance, everyone loved it, and the next day Paul said, would you do a show called The Medicine Show? We wanted, we've always wanted to do a medicine show, we think you're the guy to play the doc, the ringmaster slash snake oil salesman, because the question is not whether you can talk, but whether you'll ever shut up. So I went off and, and did The Medicine Show, and it was a lot of fun, and it was a very successful show, it was one of the most successful shows the Big Apple Circus ever did. And then I was asked if I wanted to do the next year's show, which was the 20th anniversary show. And I turned that down. And I went, you know, I really want to do the, the sideshow stuff. I don't want to do any more of the circus thing. It's just, it's not what I do. This is the stuff that I do well. We've all gone through moments when our world shifts and our outlook on things change. For me, I was 12 years old and a carnival had come to our neighborhood. And there on the midway between the rides and the games that you just couldn't win, there was this large white tent. And the outside of it was festooned with colorful banners depicting unusual people doing remarkable things. And there was a man standing on the outside saying, this is the greatest show, you gotta see it to believe it. And I went in to see that show, uh, mainly because one of the banners said Master of Magic. And the magic act I saw, that hot, August day in that tent really sucked. It was pretty lousy. It was so bad I almost left, but I'm glad I didn't because the rest of the show delivered in spades the very thing that I desired most. I want to see something extraordinary, I got it. Because there on that high catwalk-like stage were low-life, crusty carnies performing miracles, sword swallowing, fire eating, feats of strength and endurance, and it was all real. I was seeing real magic. I've worked out in Coney Island. I know what working a sideshow is all about. I've been around these wonderful veteran performers. I've absorbed all this, this great material. It's time to do a show about the sideshow because no one has done this. There have been a few people who have kind of talked about the sideshow, but there was no one really of the world that could do all the acts and really give the audience a sense of what the sideshow is all about. The life of the world of the sideshow. So I said, I want to do this, and I got thinking about the title and went, well, I'm kind of giving them a view of the carnival, and I don't want it to be a lecture, but I do want to give them some knowledge, and then the idea of calling it carnival knowledge came up. Ladies and gentlemen, if you come back down to this end of the stage, I'm going to introduce you to one of the most remarkable young women you'd ever want to meet. She is truly remarkable. Like I say, she comes from a long line of sideshow entertainers, and I'm pl very pleased to present to you now the lovely Twistina, the most flexible woman in the world. Twistina. There she is. Hi, Twistina. How are you? My friends have teased me my whole life calling me a carny, which I really, you know, I was a daughter of a guy that runs a theme park, but, you know, so I was like, I'm not a carny, but at that point, I, I truly was. This young lady can bend, stretch, twist, and contort in ways you didn't know possible. Sir, if you could bend over the way she does, you'd never leave home. 
Yeah. And we're going to demonstrate her amazing flexibility using this coffin-like cabinet right here. Let me show you. We're going to put her inside, and we're going to run 18 solid steel blades every which way through this coffin-like cabinet. But first, we have to put her inside and put her to work. Step on in there and be careful. There was like someone eating glass out here earlier. So yeah, I know. Yeah, there you go. Just step on in there. There you go. My first instinct was to picture a vertical, you know, stand-up box, and, and my head's going to be sticking out and that whole thing, or you know, lying down and they're going to saw it in half. And I was just really interested to to learn the secret and see how it's done, you know. But um, to my dismay, it was it was not that kind. These blades, like all the other blades are made out of solid steel. The first one goes right down the center and divides the cabinet in half. This one goes right down here, divides the cabinet like this. And you see they truly go all the way through from the top down through to bottom. Now your contribution to this show is a unique one because it's essentially an old sideshow gag. What has the audience reaction been when they come up on stage and take a look inside the box? Oh, um, God, everything. Um, just tonight, actually, some kid comes up and he says, he says, oh, I could do that, anyone could do that. And I was like, yeah, but you paid a buck to see it, you know. Come on up, come on here, I'll give you a change. Sure, there you go, there's a buck back for you, there you go. <laughs> they kind of get that, that suckered feeling when they get up there. Oh, that's how it's done, you know, very clever. Some woman last week came up with her kids and she's, she pinched me. And I couldn't even, I couldn't see who it was, but she reached in the box and she pinched me and I was like, what is that? And then, then her kids come around. She's like, look, you can pinch her. You can pinch. I was like, no, you can't. You can't pinch me. Don't pinch the girl. Welcome back. The lovely. Now, your experience in doing the Blade Box Girl, has that made you interested to learn other sideshow arts? I, I keep telling him, um, when, when I make my torches, he's going to teach me how to eat fire. Shannon, you know, you should really expand your, your creative performing horizons and confront your fears. Control your fears so the fears control you. You know this. I would walk on glass. I would do that. Um, that, that might be the extent of it. My act goes over real well in New York for some reason. I guess it's because it's so different. And when Todd started the Sideshow Saturday Night, he wanted me to come in and, and be one of his uh, rotating freak of the week sort of people. Howdy. Howdy. Ooh, I like y'all already. Well, folks, uh, I do perform what we call the Wild West Art. So, where are you originally from? Well, born in Louisiana, lived in Louisiana, Texas, and most of my professional life in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I performed at a little theme park there called Opryland and then got my own one-man show doing the Western thing and uh, did that show for three years there and then went into the rodeo circuit. Let's talk about Buffalo Bill. Buffalo Bill was one of the characters I was fascinated with because of his, uh, he took his real life experiences and made a, a stage show out of it. His life story was greatly exaggerated, let's put it that way. In what they call dime novels, uh, writer Ned Buntline um, met Buffalo Bill in the, the West, was fascinated with his looks, with uh, his, his overall romantic character, and wrote these dime novels about him. He was asked to put on a big celebration for his hometown in 1882. And that's when he put on an event called the Old Glory Blowout for a July the 4th celebration. And that was the precursor to the Wild West show. He had real cowboys, real Indians. Uh, the beginnings of what we know now as the rodeo uh, came from the Wild West show. And that show toured all over the world. Um, of course, that was the time when circus was hugely popular too. The circuses and the Wild West shows sort of coexisted on the road, crossing paths quite often. And in fact, toward the, the end days of Buffalo Bill's career, he actually worked with several of the smaller circuses that uh, traveled the country. But then from that, the Western arts of trick roping and bull whips, and knife and tomahawk throwing, sort of came out of the Wild West show. I always wanted to, to put together my own show, my own act. Since I grew up with a fascination of this, I got hooked on it. It was about 12 years ago now. And I had a rope in my hand every day after that 
Sideshows would always have uh, what they called the pretty act. So it's not unheard of to have a Western act in a sideshow. People all the time say things to me, well, shouldn't you be in Las Vegas? Shouldn't you be in California? Shouldn't you be in Arizona? You know, you know, if you grew up seeing a cowboy with a rope every day, then it's nothing special to you. But uh, if you live in the West Village, you know, it's a, it's a different thing. So. try to show the world that a woman can be sweet and feminine, yet dangerous and slightly frightening at the same time. You got cut out for the service industry. I love you. And I mean, I think I draw a little bit from Sideshow and a little bit from rock and roll. Like, I don't know, I'm from the MTV generation, I guess. You started off with your sister in a duo act. And well, where, where are you originally from? Uh, well, the deserts of Mauritania was our birthplace, and uh, we were born to gypsies. And then, um, Sharka tells the story better. I wish you were here. We were born to gypsies who sold us to German scientists for 100 American dollars. And then the German scientists studied us and disconnected us and um, put us up for adoption in the States. Now your sister, she moved out west. Yes. Did she still do uh, her own performance out west? No. No, she gave it up. How, how did this carry though into your everyday life? Um. Well, I would say for the most part it doesn't. I'm a completely normal person. But in other ways, well, I'm a contortionist, so it makes certain tasks like painting my toenails like much easier than like the average person, of course. You know, like there are certain things I can do just much more easily than other people can. So I guess it does carry over a little bit. And I mean, it also carries over my perception of the world. You know, if I can lay on a bed of machetes, then, you know, there are a bunch of other things that I could do. You know, there's something else besides an office job. You know, there are different kinds of people in the world and, you know, it's, it's beautiful. Like, you could be intelligent and you can be a stockbroker or you can be intelligent and you can put that to work doing something creative, thinking of things that no one else would think of. I mean, it's a skill. This 10-inch barbell that is held by both of my nipples, and I can crush objects by the sheer force of my nipples. This is my nipple. Oh, and like I said, we're gonna stretch that. Oh, oh, oh! It looks like it hurts, doesn't it? Enjoying this? You thought you lucked out with the front row seat, didn't you? You said I'm gonna get a good view of this show. Directly into my nipple. All right, think of that. You're gonna throw up. Did I hear somebody say that? Today, people need something like this. People need something that's so off the wall, something that's so different and uh, slightly shocking. The great Nipolini. So I must ask, the great Nipolini is that Italian? Sure. No, it's uh, the great Nipolini is um, something I came up with. I got the great from uh, the great Omi. Nipolini, uh, you know, obviously I'm using my nipples. And of course the Eni, everybody's got to, you know, tip their hat to the uh, great Harry Houdini. So just, you know, a string of a bunch of stuff, put it together and said this sound got a little zing to it, so I'm going to go with it. When I, was a, when I was a kid and I went and I had my first karate lessons, um, I was looking through this karate magazine and there's this picture of this guy standing on two swords, uh, holding his elbows out that had piercings through the elbows and hung buckets of water from both his elbows. You know, and this was, you know, I was a young, young child, so this was impressing on my mind. I was like, that's amazing that somebody can do that and it's not a painful experience. My father is actually the one responsible, partially, for getting me into this. I saw somebody else doing this on a videotape, and my father turned to me and said, 
oh, I bet you you could do that. And I said, all right, whatever. And so I brought out a keychain. I had this, you know, big clip keychain thing, weighs about a pound or so. And, uh, and I put it on my nipple and said, oh, there you go, see it hangs, you know? And at that point, that turned me on. In the past 10 years, I've taken my nipple piercings and I've stretched them to really large sizes. There's a couple other people out there that have been doing pierced weightlifting, which is technically what this is called. But what I do is completely real. And when I saw some other people doing it, I said, you know, that, that's really interesting. But I can do it better. I, I had read that you are interested in Asian philosophies mm -hmm. and some philosophies from the East. Yes. The Asian philosophies, the, there's uh, a lot in the Asian martial arts that strengthens your, your body and your mind and your soul and what it does is it helps you sustain pain. The uh, Hindus have a very strange religious sect called the Sadhus. Um, it's part of the Sikh religion and these holy men do insane things with their bodies. Um, and it's a very religious experience. Um, Native Americans have uh, very strong rituals uh, called the Okipa, also known as the Sundance ritual, where people would just pierce their chests and get lifted and hoisted off the ground. Uh, and uh, they would get this vision trance state. But it was all, you know, taken care of by shamans and the whole tribe would get together. It's a very deep thing. As far as sideshow, I just recently found this out in the past two years. Uh, about the history of what I do in the sideshow. So it really wasn't much of a draw. I'm sure maybe if, if, if I was exposed to it as younger, it probably would have pushed me even further into doing this. And that's, usually, that's really what the sideshow was there for. It's there to say, hey, you know what? Take a load off. Stop thinking about your nine to five. Stop thinking about your wife who's all angry at you. You know, just come on, just relax, and just like look at this guy doing something amazing. And you're gonna walk away remembering, you're never gonna forget it. It's gonna be burned in your brain. You know, you turn on the TV and you're watching like anything that's truly impossible happening and you're like, oh, okay, well, you know, that's, that's Hollywood, that's fake, you know, and then you come in here and you see it and you're like, this is real. That is true. What you are seeing is real. And it's something that people you can only see and only truly feel and understand firsthand. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Soho Playhouse. This is Carnival Knowledge. And I'm in a weird position because, you know, I look at everything as numbers in my job here, you know, because I come to manage Carnival Knowledge and I run the theater. What may be hard for me, I mean, I don't want to come home and say, oh boy, you know, we have no audience next week because that just upsets him and it's just not fair for me to do that. So I usually, it took a while, but I absolutely try to keep it separate. I mean, he'll say, how are we doing? And, you know, we're good, you know, we're fine. I'll let you know if it spikes or tanks, and you know, I'll let you know, but we're fine. So tell me, how did you meet Todd? Monday Night Magic had been going on for three months, four months maybe, and they need somebody to MC it. They're just, they really need somebody to MC it. So Todd came in and MC'd it, and it was not love at first sight. I just met him, I was like, oh, okay, well, it's nice to meet you. And he did his act. I remember like a couple weeks later, he did his act. That there's something very wrong with that man. <laughs> he, there's something very wrong with him. At the end of the show, I was cleaning up and I picked up all these crayons and I said, you know, do you need these back? Are you gonna save these? And he grabbed them and ate them. You know, I had been hit on four, but never by somebody eating crayons. Now, I have a very strong rule since I was one of the producers and basically a boss. It's very important that you don't get involved with your um, uh, employees. So I asked her out for a beer. And uh, she said yes, and that was her first mistake. And the thing about Todd is that even when we first started dating, I mean, he was just really not interested in, in, in like any kind of long-term commitment. It was just one of those things that I, I it's, you can't really explain it, you can't really put it into words. For the first time, he, for him, I think, I mean, I can't speak for him, but 
you know, he met a gal that just got his life. I truly believe now, having been in this situation, that having waited so long, that uh, anyone who is not married, the fact is you, you just have not met the right woman. I was ringmastering a circus down in Sarasota. It's called Circus Sarasota, which if you've got a show called Circus Sarasota, it's good that it's a circus and in Sarasota. At the very end of the show, he was doing curtain call. It's not called curtain call in the circus, but <clears throat> curtain call-ish. And instead, I um, stopped the show and said, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we've got 45 minutes left in the, in the year here, so if you've got any um, business to take care of, you should probably take care of it fairly quickly. As a matter of fact, I do. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is my girlfriend, Krista. Can I get a spotlight on her over here? And they hit me with a spotlight, and I, I had no idea that he was proposing. I thought that he was doing a gag with me. And she was sitting ringside and she was like, oh, what is he going to do now? I don't know what he was doing and I was pissed. <laughs> I said, this is my girlfriend, Krista, but I'd like something a little more. And uh, he started to get very emotional and the second he got emotional, I was like, oh my God. And I got down on one knee and I said, Krista, would you marry me? I mean, it was like a thousand people that were sitting in there and it just, it felt so bizarrely intimate. And then he turned around and said, no, get the hell out of the ring. I got to finish the show. Like so many things with Todd and I, it just fell into place. And I don't remember like having this genius idea, let's do a show, because we did a big show for our wedding. The first half of the show was all performance. It was uh, David Oliver doing magic. It was the last cast of the Fantastics singing Try to Remember. And it was Chris McDaniel doing the whips and the, the uh, Roping. Uh, it was uh, Dirty Martini, a wonderful stripper, doing her uh, uh, balloon popping act. It was also some excerpts from uh, Carnival of the Animals, the puppet show, one of the puppet shows that uh, Chris's uh, parents have put together. And they do with symphonies, and it's a very entertaining thing. And then the f first half is closed by Melvin Burkhardt doing some magic and hammering a nail into his nose. It's a very, very wonderful experience. And we had some spoken word done by Pendulette, some things read that he liked very much, kind of we set the tone for what the, uh, the actual marriage was going to be all about. And now, to really kick it, is the judge, but she the judge. A friend of ours, who's a magician, knew a, uh, a New York State Supreme Court justice, who happened to be an amateur magician, who marries people all the time. You got 75 bucks, he'll do it. So it was a kind of a perfect fit. A Bud Goodman is his name, and, uh, and probably still is his name. As a kid, you know, as a teenager, you're just going for the cute boy, and it's like it never dawned on me that I should try to find somebody whose life matched mine. We don't work at Sears or I mean we don't have nine to five jobs this is the only life that I know and I don't know what the moments are but there are moments where I'm walking and I'm like this is good this is good we have a great marriage we're best friends um, and we're doing what we want to do
this is this is where I am, and this is who I am. And I've been very fortunate to know some great people, like Melvin Burkhardt, who was was one of my, if not the hero. I met Melvin originally when he was working in Coney Island in the late 80s. He was doing the act, and then Melvin uh, had a few health problems and uh, went back down to Florida and, and for all intent and purpose retired. He never really did a sideshow after that. He had to be in his 80s then. So he had worked, you know, uh, over 50 years, 60 years doing this stuff and was just such a gracious man. He was a wonderful performer. He was, the term I like to use is bulletproof. You couldn't throw him. He had so much material, so many lines, so much charm, so much stage presence that he could just stand there flat-footed and do nothing and really entertain people. So he was just a, a, a real inspiration. And I didn't really know him that well but um, when he was working out in Coney Island, but I realized that uh, he was someone I should know. And so I had some opportunities to go down to Florida and when I would, I would, I, one time I called Stead of Blue and I said, hi Melvin, you probably don't remember me, because so many people, such a legendary figure in the world of the sideshow. I said, I'm Todd Robbins from New York City, we met out in Coney Island, and I would just like to come by and say hi if I could. And he said, sure, come on by. And uh, we just had a great time, we sat down, and we hit it off, and, and, and uh, uh, he was just always just such a gracious gentleman, and so giving. I mean, he was just the most giving man ever. And um, he sat down on that first day and ran through all of his material and showed me how to do things like the, the dice trick. And I'd already been hammering a nail on my nose for a while, but he had a few lines and stuff that he didn't use anymore. And he said, you might want to try these. And it's called the human blockhead because you'd have to be a complete blockhead to do something as dangerous as this. Oh, you like that? Let's take it one step further, shall we? And go, oh, uh. When I first started hammering a nail on my nose, I learned it from a performer, and I never got any heritage behind it. And when I found out Melvin was the guy, and from there on in, in every performance that I could, I would say, you know, a man by the name of Melvin Burkhart, 1929, took a torture stunt from the fake years of India, and he turned it into a joyously gut-wrenching act. That uh, when Robert, Robert Ripley, Ripley Ripley's Ripley's Believe It or, believe believe it or not, not, saw him do this, do this act, he said, Melvin, Melvin you're, you're a human, human blockhead. blockhead. And the name has stuck ever since. In honor of Melvin, I do the human blockhead. Oh, all right, I'll do it myself. Here it goes. Ah! And that's why they call me the human blockhead. Look at that. 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 Oh, I thought there was blood on there, but it's not. <laughs> oh, that's the kind of humor you like, huh? Look, look I'm running a court low. Yeah. It's dirty. Let me clean it off. Yeah. <laughs> what? You've seen the size of my nail. This, this was Melvin's nail. This is the nail that Melvin hammered into his nose all those years. And it is, it, it's a railroad spike. I mean, it's ridiculous. I'm not trying to fool anybody. I'm trying to show you that what you think you see is not always what you think you're looking at. Watch. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no. When we started planning the wedding, she was the one that said, why don't you ask Melvin if he'll perform? And I went, oh, that's such a great idea. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> so, I called him and he said, sure, sure, I'd love to do it. <laughs> and uh, he came up here and he had been under the weather. He was in pretty bad shape. But he really wanted to come up. Through the years I'd seen him perform so many times, I, I had noticed that he was slipping. Uh, and his health had not been good, and it really meant so much that for, to me that he was here. And it meant, what well, was so touching, it meant so much to him that uh, he kind of kept it all a secret. But uh, he barely made it up here. And he did the show, he did the, the wedding. 
the end of the reception was performing and wanted to go out afterwards for dinner, but Bonnie, his daughter, uh, was exhausted. So that day was from 8 o'clock in the morning to 11.30 at night for a 94-year-old man. Uh, the next day, we got up, uh, had breakfast, and I took him out to the airport, and uh, we had a nice, nice talk and uh, some time to spend before the flight. And he, uh, they got on the plane and went back to uh, Florida. And uh, a couple weeks later, he died. And his, uh, his performance at the, uh, the wedding was our, his last performance. I was just so incredibly honored that he was there. Because he was, I, I will, um, no matter how hard I work, I will never be the performer Melvin was. And uh, I will never be the man that Melvin was. It was just never such a, a wonderful, giving person. He was an inspiration to everyone that, he, that, that met him, something was that. So uh, then the ultimate um, honor was a twofold one. I got a package in the mail, and in it were Melvin's props and his costume. So, as you see in the show, I take his hat out and put it on and use his, his, uh, his hammer. So I got all this in the mail shortly after Melvin died. A couple weeks later, I got Melvin. His family sent his ashes up to me to uh, be sprinkled out in Coney Island. So on what would have been his 95th birthday, uh, I went out to Coney Island with Krista and a few other folks and Dick Ziggin, and we went out on the steeple chase pier uh, and uh, sprinkled the ashes into the ocean there. And it was a beautiful day. I mean, it was a windy as all get out, but the sunset was just gorgeous. As the sun was going down, we sprinkled the ashes and had a few quiet moments, and it was, uh, it was a very special day. Excited to be here at the uh, third annual Sideshow Gathering, Sword Swallowers Convention, and the 11th annual Tattoo Convention, the Ink in the Valley Tattoo Convention. Because of, of things like the Sideshow Gathering here this weekend and, and other events like this, there are, uh, is a resurgence of the, the Sideshow, but we're doing it now in rock clubs, and so it's a little different venue than the old circus Sideshow. This little guy's the two-headed turtle. He's got two heads, as you can see. Uh, there's been freak animals, cows, chickens, ducks, pigs, snakes, a lot of snakes. It's hard to believe. It's just too hard to believe, something with two heads. Actually, I live with them every day, so I see two heads every morning and every night. So when I go to a pet store, I see a normal one-headed turtle. I can't believe it's alive with just one head. Picture, of course, the Galen Siamese twins. Uh, they worked for us when we made the movie Being Different in 1981. One, two, three, down the hatch! Whoa! Whoa! They are brave, they are noble, they are heroes. The sword swallows. I think it's just the love of doing something different that most people can't do. You see people do these things, and to the normal everyday folk, they see these stunts, and it blows them away. Sideshows on the carnival are just about gone. To my knowledge, there's no more real 10 and one sideshows in the carnivals. Now, uh, because Ken Hark has gone into the business, and uh, so there's one, and Dick Segan at Coney Island is doing this work. 
the natural habitat of the, the carnival sideshow is, is basically gone. I mean, it's, it's Ward Hall has retired now. And there are a few people that are still trying to go out there on the carnival and do it. And a circus hasn't really carried a sideshow since 1995. And on Coney Island, we're trying to keep it alive out there, but it's getting more and more difficult every day. And the purpose of Coney Island USA is to defend the honor of American popular culture through innovative performances and exhibitions. It's putting an art form in its correct form. A lot of sideshow performers in this day and age are playing in rock clubs or playing in uh, rock concerts. Um, this stuff really came from dime museums and under canvas shows. So you feel that in a way it's, it is coming going to come back um, as an art form? I don't feel, I know. It's like re-enter the popular culture. There's a new burlesque movement. There's a sideshow movement. There's a tattoo movement. And it's all out there, and it's um, wonderfully accepted and quite mainstream at this point. Now, you know, with sideshows being pretty much dead and gone, and uh, there are a couple people holding on and saying they're doing great. They're lying. They, they can talk all they want, they're lying. I mean, it, it's a labor of love at this, at this point in history, way more than it's ever been. And um, you know, any, anybody who keeps at it, you know, Dick Ziggin and Coney Island, or Ken Hart's brothers Graham, or Todd, it's, it's all, it's all uh, love. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and gee, let's see if I can feed myself till Friday on the, on the income. That's, that's what it really boils down to. What you're seeing here tonight is a, is a dinosaur getting ready to fall over. I don't know that this will be here next year. It's a dying art form, and uh, it really is. The old style sideshow of going to a carnival, paying an extra buck to go into a tent and see something really crazy and amazing, that's gone. And that's very unfortunate, but it's kind of good that in the year 2004, right now, it's transferred into this, you know, modern sideshow. Wave to the camera, please. <laughs>
you like to go next with, uh, with Carnival Knowledge? Right over there. <laughs> Which is kind of about, about five feet from here. Todd is the one sideshow performer that I think is A number one. He's the top. He just has the attitude that the show must go on because that's the kind of person he is. Todd eats the light bulbs. I mean, there's no joke about it. And these idiots are saying, well, it's a fake. It's not. Todd Robbins has taught me so much, not just about the acts, but on presenting them and the performance of them. He gave us the idea for the girly freak show, like all girl freak review. And I don't know, was, we just love Todd. Anytime I get a chance to do a show with Todd, I'm there. I try to take in any of the shows that, um, any of the shows that I can uh, up here in New York, but certainly Todd's. Todd's very different, he's a unique performer, I think he's just, Spectacular, I think it's fantastic, yeah. He has such a class and such an aura of dignity when he does something that, that the, the worst thing would be acceptable if he did it. The last real encyclopedia of what we do is, and here's your difference again, Todd Robbins. You don't need to remember all these people's names, what they did, where they, when they died. You don't need that. But he does, and he kills me. Is that I think this what, what I'm doing is, is very special, and I don't mean that as I'm you know look at me, look at me, look at me. It's it's not a um, heart on the sleeve kind of thing. I just think this is a very interesting uh, world that I've had an opportunity to gain entree to. Well, folks, now you truly have seen it all. But this isn't the end. As I mentioned in the beginning, side shows don't have an end. It's one act after the other. Shows continue and stay as long as you like. See as much as you want. And hopefully the sideshow experience will stay with you for a while. There's a lot of kind of strange things in this world of the sideshow. And some people just don't get beyond the surface of it. It's just strange people doing weird things. And see that these are all based upon, the skills are based upon principles of physics and anatomy. That, uh, and it's just, it, it's reality at its most amazing. Because you see, I tried to show you a few things to amaze you that before tonight, before you walked in here, you didn't know could be done. And that idea that the impossible might just be possible, it's a very powerful one. The desire to try to find out what is possible in life is what motivates people to go on and do great things with their lives. It's a challenge, it's a real challenge. More so than uh, if I'd made some easier choices that would have been uh, probably more, f uh, greater financial, uh, uh, or maybe not well, easier financial, uh, uh, benefit, um, but I don't think it would have been nearly as rewarding. I think it all starts with amazement, because when you're amazed, you look at things that you don't understand, and you start to wonder, you say, how is it possible to eat glass? What goes into hammering a nail in your nose? And how can you walk over broken bottles in your bare feet? And if any of that has amazed you, then my job is done, and yours is just beginning. And now if you'll forgive me, the show goes on and I gotta go back to work. All right, folks, this is it. This is the one you've read about it, you heard about it. It's the Sideshow. Everything you see on the outside here, you're gonna see live on the inside. Everything on these banners, 10 acts and attractions. You're gonna see the master of magic. He will amaze and amuse to the confusion. And the new is the Thank you.